The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar in the series. Um, this is uh, Ligia Pina. Uh, I'm with the Technical Support Center. And um, it's great to see so many of you have signed on already. Um, so today we'll be speaking, <coughs> excuse me, today we'll be speaking about qualitative data management. Um, so we'll go over some of the basics and hopefully get some uh, tips and strategies from your experience. So we'll get started right away um, as the time flies by very quickly. But before uh, we get started, I wanted to go over some um, housekeeping issues. And um, these will sound familiar to you from other webinars. Um, so you'll remember that you can raise your hand at any time to ask a question. Um, in addition, I'll be pausing several times just to give you an opportunity to discuss and engage um, around a specific topic. And um, you'll see that you have the option um, to both uh, ask questions in the, through the question feature that you'll see in your uh, GoToWebinar uh, tab, um, or you can use the chat box as well. So um, uh, uh, they have, uh, I guess, privacy options. You can send them directly to me or you can send them to the whole group. Feel free to send them to the whole group through the chat if you'd, if you'd like to do so. Um, and then I will be unmuting you all so that you can have control over your own uh, microphone. But um, please mute yourself because um, I guess that's just to minimize feedback on the line. Um, so, but you can feel free to unmute yourself when, um, when you'd like to speak. Um, just raise your hand so that I'm also aware and I can stop and let you speak as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And while I do that, I wanted to also remind you um, that there is a five minute or, or less evaluation at the end and uh, it was really helpful to get your feedback for the previous webinar so hopefully um, you can also uh, complete it for this one. We'd love to get your feedback. So I'm going to unmute you all but please mute yourself. As you can hear there's some feedback coming up. So just mute yourself, click the little green arrow button, uh, the green microphone button, sorry about that. And while you do that, um, let's see, I'll just give you a quick webinar overview. So we'll do some quick introductions. We have a new group for this webinar um, so, um, so that we know who all is online. And then we'll go over briefly the rationale for qualitative data management and for setting up a um, data management plan. And um, then I'll, we'll go over some what I call five easy steps for good data management, but uh, maybe we can come up with more or maybe we'll, we'll discuss um, you know, how to um, think about these in a different way. And then we'll conclude and hopefully throughout the process we'll be able to get your experiences and um, and uh, plans for using these practices in your own projects. So uh, we'll move to introductions, but before going further, um, um, I wanted to again remind you to mute yourselves. So um, if you haven't done so, please mute yourselves and I'll just go down the line and um, ask each of you individually to unmute yourselves and give yourself an introduction. And um, just like the last webinar, please state the name, country, team, uh, what you're working on, and um, if you have a challenge that you faced in the past about keeping qualitative data organized, it would be helpful to hear it from you. So I'm, I'm hearing some, um, I'm sorry to be a pain about this, but if you could please meet yourselves, uh, Mohammed and Maurice, um, it would help to keep the feedback down so we don't hear any background noise. Um, so while you do that, I'll, you already know who I am. I'm Lee Jan. I'm part of the um, uh, technical support team. I'm an assistant scientist at Hopkins, and um, I guess I've been I've been doing uh, mostly mixed methods research. But um, as part of that, usually the qualitative component has been quite 
significant. So I've, um, I've faced a lot of challenges in the past about keeping qualitative data organized. Um, and I guess one that comes to mind is one project where um, I wasn't part of the data collection and I just received the transcripts for analysis. And it was quite difficult because the transcripts weren't um, well done and they weren't well organized and it was very difficult to connect back to the um, original data. So um, it made analysis quite tedious and I couldn't delve right into analysis. I had to sort of backtrack and uh, reorganize the data, get a handle for what's what, and um, that, that took some time. So that was quite challenging. Um, but I'd love to hear from, from your challenges. Um, so uh, let's see, we'll start at the top of the line. Um, Adam, if you don't mind introducing yourself. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi guys, my name's Adam. Um, I'm uh, from South Africa. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to join my South African team um, next week because um, uh, I won't uh, be here. Um, so I'm joining you guys. And um, my project title is, um, is General Practitioner Contracting in South Africa to Strengthen Health Systems. Um, and uh, a part of um, data management um, that I find difficult uh, personally is when I've done uh, um, uh, which is a policy analysis. I had all these documents. I had almost 200 documents that was just was so hard to keep track of. I've got documents, newspaper articles, and documents from different websites and sources, and um, uh, you know, parliamentary minutes and uh, media articles, and that was just a nightmare to to basically keep track of and to see how many sources I, I had and from where I had them, from where I got them from. Thanks so much, Adam. Yeah, and the, the volume can get quite overwhelming if, um, if it's uh, not well managed. So I, I, I guess I feel your pain. <laughs> um, but th thanks so much for sharing that and hopefully throughout this process um, we can reflect on, you know, what in future projects, what, what, what we can do to, to avoid being so overwhelmed by volume and multiple sources, etc. Um, we had Ahmad Sikter join. So Ahmad, uh, you missed our housekeeping bit, so I'm going to unmute you. Um, please introduce yourself, um, but uh, and afterwards please mute yourself so that we minimize feedback. Can you hear me okay, Ahmad? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, should I introduce myself? Yes, please. If you can introduce okay. yourself and uh, also share one of the challenges you faced with uh, keeping qualitative data organized. Uh, okay. I am uh, Ahmad Shafiq Sikdar Adil. I work with the Bangladesh team. And the challenges uh, regarding qualitative data actually uh, say different than quantitative. Qualitative data has a lot of text, uh, I mean from the interview, uh, the transcripts and also from the documents or other uh, papers uh, like policies or strategies. Uh, so uh, I mean it's quite quite difficult to uh, keep all these uh, in track and also follow all these uh, with a great deal of patience. Uh, because you need to read a lot, you need to hear a lot, and you need to think a lot, and you need to uh, give a lot of time with all these. And uh, again, you have to remember uh, the previous things, and you have to uh, differentiate the things, I mean, from what type of respondents, what I am getting. Uh, so, I mean, the coding, uh, the transcripts, and uh, other processes helps, but even though the mind work is uh, very great and uh, huge, uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, and also, I mean, regarding uh, communicating with the qualitative uh, uh, interviews is uh, sometimes difficult. Sometimes uh, it's with uh, high officials, so uh, sometimes it's it's difficult to access them or get time from them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Ahmad. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a shared uh, issue of uh, dealing with a lot of volume, but also the um, the patients that needed both to sort things um, sort of on paper and also in our minds. And you're already starting to make the linkages and of the importance of quality of data management with the analysis and how one can perhaps facilitate um, the other. So thank thank you so much, Ahmad. Um, I look forward to hearing more from you on this webinar. Um, thank you. So please. Go ahead, mute yourself for now. And um, Aku, do you mind introducing yourself, please? Hello, good day, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. OK, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aku Kwame. Um, I'm half of a Ghana South Africa team. My colleague, Jill uh, Olivier, is not on the call this week. Um, but our project is called Systems Integration Towards Universal Health Coverage, Strengthening the Relationship Between Faith-Based Nonprofit Providers and the Ghanaian Public Health System. So we're basically doing a, a historical realist case study, looking at the evolution between um, our Christian Health Association of Ghana and the public sector. In terms of data concerns, I, I think sort of just looking forward at the project, we have a lot of archival work to do, um, looking at um, different kinds of documents from the various um, denominational associations, so a handful of those, uh, as well as the public sector, as well as uh, archival materials. Uh, uh, published newspapers and then just the usual policy documents. So it, it's a huge amount um, since we will be looking at a 50-year window. So I think just management in terms of sheer volume organization um, and priority will be one of the, the issues that we would be looking at as we delve into the project. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how others have handled that um, in our call today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aku. And, and indeed, your, your project is quite unique because perhaps not uh, it's not typical that projects go uh, 50 years back. So um, look forward to hearing more about that and um, hearing other people's experiences. Um, Maurice, I will unmute you and please feel free to mute yourself. Um, would you like to give a brief introduction um, of you and what you're working on? And I see that you've already shared um, a, a challenge. And I'm happy to, to share that if, you, um, if you'd like. Not sure if your microphone is working or not. So um, if you can hear me, please give a sign. Hello. Um, yes, is that Ahmad or Maurice? Yeah, it's me again. Are you asking me? Uh, no, I'm uh, sorry, Ahmad, for the confusion. I'm trying to reach Maurice, but I think perhaps his microphone isn't working. Um, okay. So Maurice, um, feel free to jump in if, if your microphone starts working. Um, but just so that everybody knows, Maurice is the team lead for the Burkina Faso team. And um, they're working on uh, understanding um, the role of a public-private partnership in um, the management of malaria. And um, he wrote in the question box that one of the challenges that they have is that um, uh, you know it's gathering data from a lot of uh, from a lot of stakeholders um, as key informants and um, managing different forms of data collection. So for example, both individual interviews and, and focus groups. Um, so it's again this, this issue of managing the volume and the diversity of qualitative data. Um, so Maurice, feel, feel free to jump in, um, and hopefully your microphone starts working. But I'll, in the meantime, I'll keep going down the line. And um, Mohammed, I have unmuted you. Um, so please also unmute, unmute yourself, and uh, can you hear us okay? Uh, yeah, do you hear me? Perfect. Hi, nice uh, to meet you. Uh, hi, nice, nice to meet you too. Hi everyone, this is uh, Muhammad Ahmed from uh, Afghanistan. Actually, our uh, studies about contracting 
non-state provider for universal health coverage in Afghanistan, a case study on contextual and institutional factors influencing performance of contracted. Uh, actually, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, documents, policies, contracts, interviews, transcripts coming from interviews. Actually, the, the management of these data is a little difficult for us. That's why we want to have uh, to be able to Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, yes, I think that that's, uh, that's turning out to be the most common challenge that, that folks are uh, mentioning. So just dealing with, again, with your volume and with the uh, diversity in the types of sources that they have. Were you saying anything else? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Hello? Mohammed, was there anything else that you wanted to share at this time? Uh, no, actually, it's all. Great. Well, well, thank you so much. Um, and please, please, if you don't mind muting yourself um, until uh, the next time you'd like to speak, I won't unmute you. Um, next, uh, we have Severin. Severin, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Severin Rakic, uh, Bosnia team, uh, our research is uh, related to introduction of safety and quality standards among uh, private healthcare providers. Uh, we have recently gone through the collection and uh, analysis uh, management of a uh, big amount of interview data. What, what I found ch challenging uh, was uh, how to ensure uh, quality of transcripts, how to, how to organize transcripts if uh, the other person, interviewee, does not follow a question but uh, speaks as he likes, uh, jumping from one topic to another, and how to ensure quality of uh, of uh, very work of people who do transcription, meaning uh, anonymization of data, quality of uh, text and everything. That's thanks it. so much. Thanks so much, Severin. Good to have you on. And um, thanks for sharing the issue with transcription. I think that's, uh, that's an important uh, issue. I think it's um, quite often and um, uh, you know quite typical for uh, interviewees not to follow the guide specifically, but then that makes the issue, if, if somebody else is transcribing, uh, perhaps that makes it more challenging for them. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk a, a bit about uh, the quality control related to transcription, so hopefully um, we, can, we can reconnect on this topic again. Um, so thanks so much, and um, I will move down to Sinisha. Sinisha, please unmute yourself and share a bit about your your experience. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Sinisha. I also work in Bosnia with Bosnian team together with Severin on the same topic. It is introduction of safety and quality standards uh, with private healthcare providers, and it is. Also very true what Severin has mentioned, we had a lot of data, 48 interviews, and uh, I was one of the members of the team who has actually made the selection of the statements and the problem was how to uh, do the selection to put the statements and the responses from the interviews in uh, corresponding categories, subcategories as uh, very often the interviewees, they want to express their opinion about different topics. They don't really follow the, the questions that uh, uh, our uh, people on the field have asked. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, transcripts, uh, transcripts were very uh, big and uh, voluminous and it was really challenging to pick the necessary data from them. 
Uh, thanks so much, Sinjan. And you're talking, I think, you're starting to talk about um, also the process of uh, organizing and sort of reorganizing the data even after you have transcripts. Um, so the process of coding. And we'll, we'll touch upon it uh, briefly today. Um, Rosemary spoke about it a bit in the previous webinar. But it is definitely part of the, the management. Um, and it, it helps you set up the data for analysis. So, um, so thank you for sharing that. Hopefully, we can uh, we can go back to it uh, later in the webinar. So, good good to have you on. Um, next on the line, we have uh, Yamba. Yamba, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, can you hear me, Yamba? Hello. Hello. Bonjour. Mm -hmm. Vous m'écoutez? Mm -hmm. hey. Oui, je vous entends faiblement, mais je vous entends. Oh, bonjour. Euh, si vous voulez faire une petite introduction, euh, soit en anglais, soit en français, euh, vous pouvez partager votre nom, votre projet, et aussi si vous, quel type de souci ou de défi vous avez euh, pour organiser la, les données qualitatives. Pour organiser Euh, pour organiser, or, organiser les, les données qualitatives, pour gestionner ou organiser le, les données qualitatives, oui. Euh, Qu'on s'apprête à collecter là Oui, d'habitude après la collection, euh, si vous avez des défis, euh, beaucoup de personnes ont parlé de, de volume de données, de diversité des sources et tout ça. Ok, mais en fait pour nous d'abord, euh, nous apprêtons à aller sur le terrain. Donc les, les, les données qualitatives là n'ont pas encore été collectées. On s'apprête à aller sur le terrain. Peut-être c'est après ça maintenant qu'on verra s'il y a des défis euh, liés à l'analyse, la, au traitement et tout ça des données. Mais c'est beaucoup plus euh, au niveau du, 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 du traitement que ça va se poser, surtout le, après la collecte des données qualitatives. Normalement, on devrait le faire avec euh, NVivo, mais c'est beaucoup plus les défis liés au traitement des données qu'on va collecter là, ce qui va se poser. Mm -hmm. Merci, merci beaucoup. Ok, je vais, je vais traduire. Um, everyone, uh, Yamba is uh, also joining us from the Burkina Faso team, and his microphone is working, so I'm very happy about that. Um, they haven't collected data about their study and public-private partnerships yet, um, but they are interested in about uh, the management of the data, um, especially to prepare them for analysis. Um, they're planning to use in vivo, and uh, we'll be talking very briefly about using computer software for um, data management today, but we won't be going into the details of using in vivo, but uh, hopefully we can do that in, in future webinars. Um, but, but thank you, Yamba, for, for being here. And, um, uh, merci. Merci à vous. Si vous avez des questions, vous, vous pouvez poser comme, comme vous voulez. Uh, mais uh, entre, uh, avant de ça, s'il vous plaît, de um, faire, uh, fermer votre microphone. Comme ça, nous n'avons pas de okay, feedback. Okay. Okay. ok, ok. Merci. Merci. Et, vous, et vous pouvez demander en anglais ou en français comme vous voulez. Je peux traduire. Ok. Merci. Ok. Thank you. And um, we have finally uh, Zubin. Zubin, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Zubin Shroff. Uh, I'm managing the program of work on non-state providers in UHC from the Alliance for Health Policy Systems Research and working closely with the Technical Support Center and all of you. Uh, a lot of you met me at the workshop in Tunis. Um, so the challenges I faced in qualitative data have been more to do with um, in policy analysis of going back to high level key informants and getting parts and bits of a story one at a time because suddenly you realize there's a deeper question and you have to keep probing again and then how does that fit in to the fact that you often have developed in your head before you've um, uh, a kinds of plausible explanations and how do you then deal with new information uh, while maintaining rigor um, and knowing there's other information which you still haven't got and you're still getting new information. So it's not really data 
organization, but it's the stage of data organization to coding, which is what my challenge has been. Thanks so much, Subin, and that's uh, that's an important thing to me to mention, especially uh, because it sounds like in this type of policy analysis, you were doing the analysis concurrently with the data collection. So it's also this idea of well, how do you keep um, how do you know where the gaps are and identifying the gaps at the same time while you're collecting new data and then putting it all together and then organizing it and coding it. So I think that's very important and um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to touch base on that. So thank you so much. Um, and then last but not least, um, you might not see her in the list of att attendees because um, she's one of the organizers for the webinar, but we also have uh, Rosemary Morgan joining us again. Uh, Rosemary, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Rosemary Morgan from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health here in Baltimore. Uh, and I met lots of you last on the last webinar on just uh, the analysis of qualitative data. And we just touched a little bit on management, so I'm really happy that we can go much more in detail about how we organize and manage data. I mean, some of the challenges that I faced, one is um, the, last, the last data I, I analyzed, it was just focus group discussions. However, they, we had three districts, and then in each district, there were three different set of stakeholders that were at, and then, um, within, and then within those districts, there were sub-counties. So trying to find a system to categorize and number all of the, you know, the districts and the sub-districts and the stakeholders was challenging. And then that added state, I talked in the last webinar about framework analysis. And then in, when, if, you, if you choose to do that in the charting stage, it comes really important to be able to um, number your data in such a way that you can go back to the original source. So that was also something that that I've always found challenging and takes some time to think about and to make sure it's organized in a really logical uh, way. So thank you. Thanks so much, Rosemary. And um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Data, uh, even if data collection might seem simple, because if you have one form of um, data collection, um, and qualitative data analysis always has multiple layers and um, keeping these uh, organized and helping to prepare for the analysis um, is, is very important in these cases. So we'll, we'll throughout the webinar, um, touch upon, you know, um, the, the potential differences or the potential additional things one needs to do in, in smaller projects and larger projects in projects with multiple layers. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll come back to this issue. Um, so um, without further ado, I'll, I'll keep going. Thank you for sharing um, all your experiences. And it's really great to have um, so many of you here. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, we'll move to uh, speaking about why do qualitative data management and speaking a little bit, bit about the data management plan. And perhaps these things are all very familiar to you, but I thought it might be helpful to um, state them up front in any case. Um, so one of the, the, the I, I found three main reasons why it's important to um, have uh, robust qualitative data management. Um, one, it's this issue of data accessibility and consistency. Um, and many of you mentioned the challenges of dealing with large volumes of data, mixed resources, potentially multiple sites. In larger projects, you also have multiple researchers. So having a, um, the patience to really organize uh, the data well and to keep it consistent um, it helps, with, uh, helps with that. Um, another reason is this issue of data security. And um, I guess when we talk about data security, we usually find it in IRB plans and it talks about you know, the protection of confidentiality and making sure that the data is protected. But it's also um, related to facilitating the transparency of, of how the data is collected and stored, um, accountability to um, the various sources, both to the respondents and also to the funders. And data security is also important for archiving because um, data usually is kept for several years after collection. And um, if somebody else would want to access it later for further analysis or whatnot, 
um, having it very well organized um, is important because oftentimes the initial team might, may not be involved. Uh, there might be some turnover, so that, that's very important. Um, and in many of your challenges, you already started speaking about the analysis part. And really, um, I think that a good system for qualitative data management can promote, um, uh, can, can make your analysis more rigorous. Um, you can uh, more easily keep track of the analysis process and be transparent about what you did when with using what data. And um, it helps to ensure one of the important quality of data analysis uh, criteria, which is trust trustworthiness. So having a good system uh, really contributes to the credibility, dependability of the data, and being able to really organize it well helps you get to that um, thick description, description that you want in many cases, and so it helps uh, also contribute to transferability. Um, another reason, and, and I guess another set of reasons and for why data should be managed systematically, and these I think are probably in common with uh, quantitative data as well, is that it's really good scientific practice. I mean, we make a commitment to our respondents, to ethical review boards, to funders, and um, it's just good practice to be organized. Uh, in addition to making our lives easier. Um, many of you will have noticed that um, probably many of the proposals um, and um, almost all ethics review board applications that I've seen, um, you already have to propose a data management plan. And this was actually the case also with the WHO Ethical Review Committee uh, form. So many of you proposed um, at that time a couple of paragraphs um, um, or, or like a page um, in which you spoke about uh, um, data management. Um, so it's something that it's really encouraged to be thought through from the very beginning, from the um, first time when you start setting together your team. And um, it's, uh, again, and I guess I'll emphasize this throughout the, um, the webinar today, but it's really indispensable to analysis. So it's very important to be prepared. And um, in qualitative data analysis, um, you'll remember this uh, chart from Rosemary's presentation last week. So it's really um, an iter iterative process. But in many ways, a lot of the different stages in qualitative data analysis are actually management of the data. So um, from the time when you begin collecting data and you start having notes or uh, initial interviews um, uh, to the point where you begin rearranging the data, um, all of that um, is, is also considered data management. So as you see, it's a huge part of analysis. And um, some argue, and I've heard this many times, that qualitative data analysis is actually 80% management. Because to get to the point where you extract themes, um, there's a lot of preparation that one does, and um, oftentimes that's associated with, uh, with the management piece. Um, and you'll remember also this from uh, Rosemary's presentation. I just wanted to, again, remind you of um, the, the role of data management in the analytical hierarchy. And this is just to show that it's really at the foundation of the um, analysis piece. So um, having good uh, data management and uh, really gets you to almost uh, the first phases of the descriptive analysis. So it's um, it's it it includes um, the the transition to the analysis as well. So um, based on that. Um, I mentioned the data management description that is usually in um, ethics applications, but um, separate from that, especially for large projects, it's helpful to have a more detailed data management plan. And regardless of how and at what point you structure it, hopefully, um, ideally in the earlier parts of the project, um, the data management plan would include a description of the data, a description of the rights associated with it, so who has um, access to these rights, um, how will you share data, 
Um, some notes on confidentiality and data security. So how, are, how will you protect the identity of the respondents? And then how will you protect the data as a whole as you um, uh, put it together? Um, it's never too early to think about what kind of formats you will have coming in and um, how will you manage those different formats um, and also whether or not you will be using uh, computer software to help with the management. And um, the, another thing that's helpful is this um, a, a, an initial plan or documentation of the data processing and content. And this includes um, the tracking pro procedures. So what, um, when will you be getting what type of data and how will you be, um, uh, how will you be tracking how it's uh, progressing from, let's say, uh, data collection to transcription to analysis, um, et cetera. And another thing that's important to think about is the life cycle of the data. So how long will you be keeping the raw co um, paper copies, for example? How long will you be keeping the audios? Um, what type of archiving and preservation um, stipulations will you make? And um, who will have access to it throughout the, the course of the data? Or, or you know, if somebody was to request access to it, who would they request this access from? And um, well, these are not perhaps main components. Um, two things that I wanted to highlight as part of that is the team responsibilities and data sharing. And um, the team responsibilities are especially important when you have a larger project. And I say that only because if you have a smaller project, you might end up doing most, if not all, of the work as a principal investigator. Um, I, I guess I'm thinking specifically of my, you know, when you, when you do your dissertation research, for example, or when you have a small study, maybe you work with one or one other colleague and let's say two or three other students. Um, so there's everybody shares in the team responsibilities. But in larger projects that are multi-site, you might want to think about at each site um, if there's a quality control person, who's coordinating it all, who's coordinating the, uh, um, I guess, all sites. And um, the other thing that's important is the data sharing. How do team members access data from whom? Um, how do external people access data? Um, and you know, what kind of data can they have access to? So those are uh, important things um, that, again, uh, depend on the type of program project that you have, but are helpful to think through, um, particularly early in the process. And um, I wanted to highlight that really the data management is again very closely linked to data security and ethics. And it's often, I guess even when um, a few years ago, it, it was typical to say in your IRB application that, well, you know, the data will be locked in filing cabinets, etc. But um, for example, now that, you know, if you have uh, teams that are in multiple countries, um, you might have um, a Dropbox, you might be sharing uh, through the cloud. Um, it's, uh, it, I think it's no longer sufficient to think about the filing cabinets because the filing cabinets are, are a pretty static thing. Um, so I think it's helpful to think through the various options. Um, another thing that came up actually as part of the review process for this, these projects is how you're storing the recordings um, and what type of devices you use for doing the recordings, even at the data collection phase. So it's this idea that, well, you know, if you're using a voice recorder that's only used for this purpose, um, you have one level of security. Um, oftentimes, nowadays, our, our phones have recorders and ways to store a lot of information. So um, what are some of the challenges when you're using smartphones or, you know, should you use smartphones for uh, data recording? So I think you have to think about the data storage during data collection after data collection, after processing. And it's important to find ways to track the data, the consent form, the interview details, et cetera. Um, and also to protect, of course, the um, interviewees' uh, names and other identifiers, which uh, usually are stored separately. So let me stop there and ask you, I guess based on your experience, um, how do you know when you're not doing a good job at 
data management. What are some of the signs, symptoms? Um, what happens when, when something's not going well? Uh, can you share from your experience? And please feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, um, and we can go from there. While you're thinking, I guess one of one of my telltale signs is that um, I feel I feel quite overwhelmed. Um, I feel like I'm just stuck in the middle of just a lot of data, and I don't know how to proceed. Um, let's see, Mohammed, please go ahead and unmute yourself. How do you? What do you think? Uh, uh, thank you. Actually, during the uh, interview. Before the interview, uh, we have to fill the uh, consent paper uh, by the interviewer. Uh, uh, during one of the interview, I missed this, uh, uh, and now I don't have access to him uh, because if I fill this paper again, I need to travel again to the field and uh, uh, read its mess during the and data collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I mean, sometimes there's only one one chance to get all the information that you need, and um, yeah. it could be. I mean, I, it's. I think it's happened. You know, it happens to us all. But um, you know, we miss we miss our opportunities. So that's why maybe perhaps during um, data collection, it's helpful to have like. I know I make checklists for myself of things that to do, but. You know, even those sometimes fail. So thank, thank you for sharing, Mohammed. I think that's a very relevant. Yeah. Then, then uh, it's a good uh, lesson learned for me. And in the future, I try, I will try the best to have a checklist uh, to not to, to to prevent this such missing in the future. Yeah. It's uh, it's 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 hard. Sometimes there's a lot going on. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely a challenge that I I uh, I sympathize with. Um, how about anyone else? Anybody have um, another example? I guess Adam, I'm remembering you were you were mentioning uh, feeling overwhelmed with a lot of the 200 documents or so. Um, do you have any other challenges you wanted to share? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, um, when I think about it, when I, I suppose um, when I know that I'm not doing a good job is is when you know it comes to writing up and I'm. I've got my interpretations, um, you know, on, you know, and I've, I've got my um, matrices, you know, and, and I've extracted all the data, and I've got my themes, um, and then I'm trying to explain my themes, and obviously back it up with quotes and, do and you know, um, and documents, and, and referencing the documents, uh, referencing the interviews, and then you know struggling to find that document that I remembered something was in or uh, struggling to find maybe uh, that quote that I want to do uh, extract from the interview. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think that is, uh, if, if you're really struggling to do that, then, then, then perhaps you haven't done a good job. And um, not to say that, that that happened to me, but I think that it, it, it could have come close if I didn't uh, you know, keep track of, of everything that I was collecting. So that yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you for sharing that. I think that's that's very relevant, and I think I think that probably happens to any and all of us at some point. Um, and I think it's um, it's it's important to to think to think to think about the analysis part and wanting to retrieve the data when you're when you're just starting to collect it. And then to be diligent, and it's hard sometimes because it is a lot of data, and it's um, oftentimes there's also time pressure to um, <clears throat> move forward quickly. So uh, you know, a, a lot of these things can happen. Um, 
So thank you both for sharing your experiences. Um, I had uh, just a list here of, of things um, that you know maybe you're, maybe you'll identify with, maybe not. Um, but you know, for example, you don't know how many interviews of or FGDs have been conducted. Um, the data is, is scattered. Some files that should be digital are um, not yet digital. It's it's difficult, like Adam said, maybe to backtrack and to find what you need. Um, one of the issues is that the data is out. One is not used, and therefore it can be accessed by uh, folks that um, were not part of the study or may not have the data access rights. Um, the filings create confusion. Um, you know, you're, you're asked an inquiry or you have to give a progress update to your IRB, but you can't find the appropriate information or the consent forms. Um, one of the issues that uh, I've dealt with many times is that the transcription or translation is incomplete or incorrect. Um, it can also breach ethical requirements if it identifies uh, information that should be anonymized or concealed. And um, you're not sure who is allowed to, to access the data. And to that, I think the I think the list unfortunately could go on and on. I think you know it's it's uh, it's an issue if um, you know you well, sometimes you don't think about asking certain things or you know you, maybe you forget to get a contact number uh, from a person and you know you're not able to follow up uh, for um, either additional data collection or whatnot. So it's important to keep the contacts somewhere safe. Um, or again, you know if you can't. Um, go back to fi find the quotes that you need when you need them. Um, so um, to help us get through that, I'll present five steps for good data management. So these are five sort of good practices. Um, I want to emphasize that I'm presenting these sequentially, but really um, I think they don't necessarily have to happen in this order. And I say that because, for example, you might want to establish your quality control procedures right when you design your team, especially for a large study where you need a, a data manager or, or a coordinator. Um, whereas, um, you know, the, the clear filing and naming system might come in closer when you are collecting the data. But it's important to think about these things early. So I'm presenting them in these, the sequence, but um, please know that oftentimes it's, it's more iterative and more fluid than uh, this this particular order. Um, so the the five things that we'll go through individually are um, filing and selecting a file a clear file naming system, um, understanding how to track your data, establishing um, uh, transcription translation and coding procedures, um, establishing quality control procedures, which is very important, and um, planning your time. So establishing a realistic time for what, how long it takes to do data collection and analysis. So um, I'll go through the first step, and this seems pretty straightforward, um, but there are still often issues with it, and um, you know I think it can happen to all of us. Um, so I'm going to present to you a list of filings, and. Can I get a volunteer to let me know what um, what maybe do you see that's funny with this file naming system, and uh, maybe if you can let us know how it can be improved. Ahmad, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the first one, manager Kawimpi, HCIB. So I think here his identity is exposed in the name mm -hmm. uh, and the later part uh, probably it's a date uh, but I think the date format should be year month and date not date month and year uh, the next one manager it's also identity exposed and uh, the abbreviation is not clear to me maybe someone working with the data will know it it's fine because uh, it, it, it do not have to be open for all. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, provider, next provider, Kirudu, HCII, nurse, that dot doc. 
uh, okay I mean uh, main thing is here uh, all the names are in the file name mm -hmm. and 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 the date format should be changed I think and what more uh, FGD facility patients uh, Another thing, if if we uh, want to track files, say if we need to do 20 interview, then share, there should be some uh, some tracking system. I mean to maintain the chronology. Mm -hmm. uh, the date can serve the purpose, but uh, not always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that, Aman. Those are great suggestions. So the um, you're right that um, so these are not. Um, I guess I didn't clarify and that's maybe something because it's uh, I guess insider study knowledge but these are actually facility names but effectively you're absolutely right I mean usually at these facilities um, there's only one manager so um, even if they're not identified by name you know exactly where to find them and um, so that that really poses the, the difficulty uh, and, and is a potential breach in confidentiality it also doesn't make it uh, easy because you know you have the manager in the first one you have an in charge specified in the second one but was the first one an in charge as well um, and it's for the first three it's unclear um, you know what type, what form of data collection it was and um, it's unclear what facility uh, the last FGD was was taking place in and you're absolutely right that the data the date format is is a little off in a way that it in meaning that it can't be sorted, right? So if you were to sort them, uh, it wouldn't sort uh, in, in the format that it's currently placed. So th thank you so much for these, these suggestions. I um, am proposing one thing. Actually, I, I, didn't ch I didn't think about changing the name, but I um, uh, proposed here perhaps an alternate naming system. So, you know, instead of naming the facilities, especially if there's only one um, respondent that can fill that category, perhaps uh, having a code for the facility. Um, same for the uh, stakeholder respondents. Usually there's only one district health officer uh, in a particular district, so rather than identifying him, uh, maybe numbering policy stakeholders would be better. And um, then, of course, like you said, having adding some tracking mechanism, which this uh, file naming system does not, um, would be really helpful. Um, so I guess based on that, um, uh, let me then uh, go through some of the file naming uh, elements and why they're important to, um, to include. And then I'll stop to see if you have other suggestions as well. So um, it's important because, as many of you have mentioned already, uh, there are many files that need to be uh, uh, correspond with one another. Um, an audio file, consent form, uh, transcript, etc. cetera. Um, and oftentimes, especially in larger studies, the person who collects the data is not the person who transcribes, is not the person who analyzes. Um, and if you have multiple moving parts, like um, Rosemary was saying that, you know, she had three districts with sub-counties and three different types of stakeholders. Um, you know, a, a many of you have uh, mixed methods. Um, you know, you can also have longitudinal data collection. Um, it, it really makes it important to develop this naming system early on and to keep it consistent. Um, so it, uh, it helps you better, better track the data and better keep track of what you have already. Um, and there's some elements that are useful, not to imply that all of these should be used, um, uh, you know, in, in all circumstances, but some elements that you can consider for the naming your files when you collect your data are ID number, um, type of data collection method, or um, type of document, because not many of you are using also secondary data. So, um, you know, if it's archive data, then it might be a particular type of, of archive data. Um, the site of the data collection, um, who did the data, who collected the data, um, the date is very important. And, you know, some, there might be some demographic or, um, 
other codes that might be needed. For example, if you're looking at uh, male and women respondents, if you're comparing the two perspectives, you might want to add some of that information there. Um, so these are, maybe not all of these should be used in all filings, but these are some examples of elements to include. Um, so let me stop there briefly and um, I guess for, for your projects, for these projects that you're working on, um, uh, for these, this particular grant, um, can you share uh, your ideas for how, how you're currently naming the data or what types of elements you're using or how you're planning to do that in the future if you haven't collected yet? And please uh, raise your hand or uh, unmute yourself. Oh, Ahmed, please go ahead. Ahmad, did you raise your hand? If so, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, maybe that was from the past last question. So, uh, well, let's see. How about uh, somebody from the Bosnia team, Severin or Stinisha? Um, you've collected some of the data already. Do you have any tips or experiences on uh, file naming convention? Yes, uh, we can. Uh, I, by the pose the question, I was just going back to to data. <laughs> Thanks, how, Severin. How, how we named it. Uh, uh, there's a lot of possibility. What uh, what I, what we all, what I always do with uh, naming of the data is to think uh, what is the most important thing for me and put it on the beginning of the name. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning that uh, there's a lot of uh, option. How can you structure the name of the data? Sometimes it, it's important that uh, date comes first. Uh, sometimes it's important that type of uh, data collection comes first because uh, what comes first then it sorts out uh, the data in the folder. Uh, what, uh, what we do have currently, I was just looking at uh, the folder, uh, we have uh, word uh, transcript in the name which might not be there or it should be there, not sure, but we have it as a reminder of type of, uh, type of file. And uh, then we have uh, four, four codes, uh, four letter codes. Uh, two, first two letter is a type of provider. We have three types of providers, so we have uh, two, two letters for each provider for, for a type of transcript. And then uh, there's a numerical number. Uh, so it's, uh, it's simple enough for us, it was simple enough for us to, that uh, we can immediately see how many uh, transcripts of each type we have and uh, it's easy for, for us to search. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for sharing that, Severin. Yes, it seems like you worked out together with your team something that is relevant to your study that helps you identify. I, um, so as part of your study, I know you're doing the three case studies of the three professions, and it, you're, um, it seems like you've organized the, the, the transcripts by case, which, again, will help you um, uh, keep, them, keep them straight. And, and if you use a computer um, software, for example, it can help you also um, retrieve data by, by that particular criteria. So that, that's really helpful. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is one example, and uh, again, it should work for your study, but it should be um, consistent, and um, to be honest, it should be as, as simple as, as possible. I mean, you want to um, keep these uh, so that they're understandable to all team members. They're not, they're not too mysterious, um, but you know, they, just, they just basically do the job. Um, so thank you for those inputs. Um, let's move on to the next step, and this is um, this is a very important one, I think, uh, creating a data tracking system. And um, this is applies both to paper and digital data. I mean, some I, I don't know if um, all the different plans that you have, but it some people do uh, paper-based analysis. Um, some people do um, uh, analysis of I guess the, the transcribed data that's in a Word document form and it's used with a computer software. 
Um, but really, the data tracking piece um, is, is very important. And actually, I did uh, manual data analysis uh, once, and I'm uh, using just paper, and I found it quite quite challenging. I found that uh, the tracking is even more important than the, as you cut up the different pieces and move them around. It's important to to know both where the data is, and then as part of the coding process, be able to keep um, track of it. Um, how you're tracking the data, again, depends on the size and complexity of your study. Um, but ideally, um, what, what I found, it's really useful to um, think through this data tracking before the data collection begins. Um, so for example, um, I'm going to be part of a two-country um, uh, longitudinal case study um, research piece um, that has both quantitative and qualitative components. Um, and uh, you know, in order to keep track of it all at the national and sub-district level, um, we have to really plan ahead and, and think about this before we even go to the field to train data collectors, et cetera. Um, and it's important to safely keep copies of your data. So um, especially because nowadays a lot is uh, on computers, it, it's helpful to have multiple copies, but to ensure that it's uh, you know kept safely. And um, uh, one, one practice that I think is really useful is to have a work copy and a copy that's uh, sort of in the, back, in the background for safekeeping. Um, and for a large study, I wanted to give you an example of what might uh, a data tracking system look like. And I won't go through it step by step, but you can basically tell that it's um, that multiple people are involved, right? So you have interviewers, transcribers, translators, coders, um, but that they do have a unified point that they're coming back to. It's this coordinator that reviews the f files, um, he downloads the names and audios, um, he does quality control. Um, so it's, it's really, especially in a larger study, it's important to have the central person who um, uh, essentially can both uh, keep track of the data in a very organized fashion and also can identify problems at each of these particular steps. Um, so, you know, if the, not all the interviewers uh, uh, submitted their data, then this uh, would be flagged at the beginning of the process rather than at the end when you're ready to, to analyze. Um, so, um, how would this be different for a small study? Well, the studies where I worked on a small team, we didn't have a coordinator. Um, so essentially the coordinator tasks were split uh, across the different team members and in that particular uh, setting it was really helpful to know uh, upfront what everybody is responsible for. Um, so if we all collected data then we were each responsible for our own, uh, managing our own uh, data files but in a very coordinated fashion and the PI was always um, able to uh, have sort of um, uh, oversight of the whole process. Um, <clears throat> but I would say that the main takeaways for this data tracking is that um, quality control is very important and um, it's important to have problem solving space so to say. Um, so it's the, this idea of frequent check-ins and um, you know the idea that it, it, it's better to identify gaps and issues at the beginning of the process rather than when you're ready to sit down and, and analyze. Um, and that uh, sometimes you need to coordinate multiple people doing multiple things. I mean, this just talks about interview data, but um, <clears throat> it can be also quite different and challenging if you have multiple forms of data collection with multiple respondents, et cetera. Um, and the other thing that's important to think about is that uh, this coordinator function, it's helpful to think about it at the proposal stage because this is not a job that uh, is, a, is a small level of effort. So uh, it's helpful to budget and plan to have this, this person, perhaps even a data manager if needed, depending on the size of your study. So let's see, we have <clears throat> a question, Maurice was asking what is QC? It is um, quality control. So uh, quality control process. 
thank you for thank you for your question. And I just typed it to you all. Um, so next, I was wondering if you had um, an example of a tracking procedure that you implemented or are planning to implement for your study. And um, in the in this sense, I I guess I had an example. I did a study in um, Bangladesh and I was part of a, part of a larger team. And uh, we worked in multiple villages and so multiple sites and there was both quantitative and qualitative data collected. And what happened is that at each site there was a coordinator that basically collected all the data and uh, kept track of it every day. Um, and you know it compared it to the planned data collection for the day to actual data collection for the day. And then um, this person was in charge of downloading all the files and making sure that they're named correctly, et cetera. And then um, uh, there was, uh, I guess, a cross-site uh, coordination where after the two, three days of data collection, we all came together and um, there was this uh, uh, process of cross-checking across all the sites, what was accomplished, you know, any issues. And what was really helpful in these daily meetings with the site coordinator was that interviewers and data collectors were able to um, not only bring up issues of um, you know potential confidentiality or you know potential quality of the data but also um, you know able be they're able to uh, both share and get tips from the study coordinator on how to improve the management and that really made um, you know, at the end of the two-week data collection period, that made life much easier when it came to analysis because everything was was already organized. So organizing in real time is is really important. Um, so that's one example from from my experience. Um, does anybody have an example from your past experience or um, related to this study that they want to share? Ahmed, yes, please. I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, for our study, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's not a very big study. Uh, there are interviews we conduct. So at first we thought uh, the file management system or the tracking system uh, can be uh, based on, uh, say, all the components, say, the audio, then the transcription, then the coded outputs, all things for one interview in the same folder. Or it can be uh, like uh, each type of component in, in different folder to track, right? like all the transcripts in one folder and uh, chronologically named uh, one by one, and then all the audio files in one folder, then chronologically named one by one. Uh, but uh, we did the first one because uh, then it, it is easier to track back in the audio uh, in the same folder. Uh, and also uh, for, say there are different types of, uh, like six, six types of uh, interviewing. Uh, and uh, so like uh, we code for each type of interview and uh, gave a serial number. Uh, for each type. Uh, so like if C is one category then C123 and D is one category then D123 like that. And also to keep track of the whole uh, in progress uh, there is also one, two, three, four at the beginning of a folder where we keep all the other files like uh, from the very beginning it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, say uh, up to the total number of interviews required. So thus, uh, we can track the total number. We can track the uh, the interviews according to categories also. And uh, actually, uh, initially there were some uh, plan to name the folders with date and uh, who interviewed and some other components. Uh, but later, we just uh, taken it uh, the simple way, uh, like that. Uh, 
whole tracking number, then the type of uh, interview, and then the sub number of each each type. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. another thing, you, you said that uh, we can we can have uh, double copies, like one one working copy and mm -hmm. one safe copy. Uh, currently, we we preserve our files in Dropbox. Uh, sometimes I copy the whole Dropbox file into an offline whole Dropbox folder into an offline folder. Uh, but um, regularly, uh, say for each file created. Uh, creating a double copy is not practiced uh, currently, but I'm thinking that uh, probably from tomorrow I'll start doing that. Say I'll keep another copy in, in a Google Drive or in just offline. Uh, okay, that's my uh, I mean experience or what what I'm practicing right now. So uh, so do you have any comment? Uh, thank you, Ahmed. That's uh, that's great. It's um it's really helpful to to hear your example. As we said earlier, you know, each of these have to work for the the, the team and the the type of data that's collected. But it seems like you um, what you emphasized in your um, in your tracking system is um, uh, the you know what type of data collection is happening, um, what type of data. Uh, is collected um, and to get a sense of the total and also the progress and the categories that are being used. Um, so I think that those, you know, as you said, it's, a, it's not a very big study, so I think for, for those purposes it's, uh, it's helpful. And of course I think that um, the, uh, I, I also share a lot of things on Dropbox. I think um, there's uh, increasing questions about whether to what degree that makes sense and um, I say this as I'm currently sharing things on Dropbox but I've had a couple experiences um, where the Dropbox files became corrupted like you know it was shared with another colleague and um, uh, they had a virus or something and something corrupted the files and it was fine in the sense that um, you know the Dropbox people could recover them but it still raised the question of, well, does that mean that the Dropbox people had access to the data and they could see it? Um, so I think in addition to Dropbox, uh, what I started doing is keeping a separate, um, like the, the original data, keeping it on my hard drive alone and, you know, only the parts that are need to be shared to keep on Dropbox. And um, I know some universities actually have um, special sharing mechanisms that are approved by their ethics boards. And I, I think it's it's not an area where the answers are clear yet, but I think in the future there might be more um, guidelines coming from um, coming about in data security on on things like Dropbox or Google Drive or things like that. So it's um, it's I think right now we're, we're all doing it, but uh, I don't know in the next five years that might have to that might have to be tweaked or changed. But but thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, I thought I think that was really helpful. And um, uh, we had a question from Maurice, so um, I'll just uh, say it. He was asking about uh, how to say tracking procedures in French. So uh, tracking procedures sont the procédures pour uh, suivre les données et les documents qui uh, sont uh, collectés pour um, se rendre compte uh, si on a fait de, du progrès qu'on a fait et aussi uh, des choses qu'on a collectées. Collecté. Euh, donc j'espère que je l'ai bien expliqué, sinon on peut parler de ça euh, après le webinaire. Um, so sorry, I was quicker to, to say than to write. Um, so, uh, thank you for sharing your experiences again, Ahmed. We'll move on. Um, the third step, and um, I won't spend too much time on this one, but it's um, uh, a very important one. Um, it's basically establishing the transcription, translation, and coding procedures. Um, and um, you know, one of the first questions that you have to ask yourself, and again, this is at the very beginning of the project because um, all of these the transcription is quite um, a resource uh, uh, requires uh, resources, both time and money, potentially. 
So it's important to, to think about who will transcribe from the beginning. Um, and you know, it's either the persons who interview themselves, a uh, professional transcription company, or you hire your own staff. Um, I've worked with um, all three options as part of it. Um, I think if you have a small study it, and you have the time, I think it's very a rich experience to transcribe your own interviews. Um, unfortunately, not that kind of luxury is not uh, usually available on projects with a shorter time span. Um, in which case, professional transcription services or in-house work um, can help, but um, you know you have both pros and cons to consider in terms of the cost, the time that is needed to um, to get the actual product, and then also the, um, the how much control you have and how much quality control uh, you should do. You, you will have to do for some of these. Um, as I mentioned, I think um, my, I guess my challenge in the beginning was that you know I received transcripts that weren't well done, and that's because um, you know after you don't always have control over the the transcription. If if somebody else manages the transcription, you get the poor transcripts, then you're kind of stuck. So it's a very um, important piece, and it's one to important to think about. Um, and just quickly, uh, what you should transcribe, um, I mean, in some cases, I don't know if this is your case for these studies, but you um, might just uh, select which recordings to transcribe or select certain parts of a particular recording. Um, for example, if, if you're doing a sub-study and um, you know, you're, it, it's only pertaining to some specific questions uh, that were asked and not to the whole um, uh, recording, then you might just do selected parts. Um, a verbatim transcript, which means word for word, is um, and uh, also including um, uh, uh, missing words, meaningless translation slangs, etc., is usually best. Um, so it's important to explain that to your transcribers. And um, it's also important to uh, keep the transcription consistent. So establish conventions for transcribing. Uh, like, you know, uh, timestamps, which is basically um, every two minutes the transcriber uh, marks the time. And that to me is always very useful because you do end up going to the original recording quite a lot anyways. Um, having a page layout and spacing that is comfortable to you and um, choosing the symbols that uh, are useful to you and then having all the transcribers um, stick to them. Um, those are also very important. Um, and similar to the file naming techniques, I mean these are not the only ones, and um, you know these may not you might have additional ones to to uh, want to include. But these are just some examples of um, transcriptions conventions. So um, how if there's talk omitted, or if the transcriber doesn't understand a particular part of the um, recording if there's a silence, if there's laughing or something else. I mean, you want to, ideally you want the transcriber to, um, to mark all of those so that you really get the nuances in, uh, as part of your analysis. Um, but you know, you might use your own conventions. So um, real quick, um, I have a couple of examples of maybe not so good transcriptions that we'll go through um, briefly. So don't read it word for word, but um, see if you can think about one or two things that um, could be improved in this example. So I don't see any hands, but maybe one thing that um, that I, I'll just point out is one thing that was really difficult here is that it was supposed to be uh, verbatim transcripts, but really the, there was no nuance. It's, it read more like notes rather than um, rather than a, you know a transcription from an audio recording. And also something that was difficult is that um, again it's the file naming. And the fact that um, it's possible to trace back to the respondent, which is um, not helpful. 
And um, similarly here, I mean, as you can see between the first one and the second one, this one is done in one style. Questions are numbered and respondents are not um, described. I mean, they're not, their answers are not marked. Um, and in uh, this example, uh, the, uh, the numbering is different. So ideally, in a particular study, you would have uh, a very consistent transcript form so that when you import these into the computer software or whether you're doing it by hand if you're printing it, they should all be very consistent. Um, and I think that also helps to, in a way, um, declutter the uh, data so that you're better able to focus on analyzing it rather than on trying to understand what, what, what is actually written. Um, and the confidentiality is, is very important in transcription. Um, and it's important to uh, uh, make sure that transcribers know how, what, to, uh, what to transcribe, what not to transcribe. Um, it's also important to have some assurance that the transcribers themselves um, adhere to um, some confidentiality uh, measures so that they know how to protect data, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, it's important to also ask yourself, um, not just about transcription, but in, in general, um, also in translation, including how to ensure confidentiality. So these are some of the questions that you should ask yourself uh, about it. Um, translation is uh, something that you may or may not be doing, um, especially of the data. I mean, you may not need to. Um, it usually takes quite a while. Um, but you should do it only if there's a particular purpose for this, this translation. So, um, for example, um, the Bosnia team, I know that you conducted all your interviews in um, the local language in Serbia, but I mean, um, there was no customer really for the English version of the data or the French version of the data, so there was no need to translate in that case. Um, and But if you do translate, it's important to think about the ownership of the data and who um, has access to it after translation. And that should also be part of your initial plan. Um, now, coding um, is part of the, um, the management process. I, Rosemary went into it very briefly last time, and this time I won't be going into greater detail either. These are actually Rosemary's slides. Uh, but it's important to remember that after you um, have your transcribed, translated um, data, that you then move to developing a coding frame um, based on these different criteria. And um, there's different types of codes that um, you will be interested in, in developing. And um, depending on whether you do the data analysis sequentially or at the same time, um, it becomes important who codes the data. So, um, you know, if you're coding the data while you're uh, doing the data collection, then you want the coder to be more attuned, um, perhaps to the uh, what their you know, the research questions and the analysis. Um, if you're doing it sequentially, then it's, let's say in large studies, you might have a team that only does the coding, and then somebody else that does the analysis. Um, and in that case, it gives a different, um, a different uh, sort of uh, dynamic to the team. Um, so it might be a more, the coding and the analysis might be a little bit more separate. But in many ways, um, the coding part is really the transition phase between management and um, analysis. Um, so um, I had some questions for you, but for the sake of time, we'll, we'll move on. Um, and it's, um, I guess, just important to think about um, for any of these three processes uh, to do testing and quality control. Because again, for trans transcription, for example, you don't want the transcriber to do all 20 uh, voice recordings and then only then you're able to take a look at it. It's important to have them do one, check it, uh, double check with the data, the audio recording, and then go back. And it's the same if you have a team of uh, coders. You want to make sure that there's some reliability uh, between 
their work. Um, so that's why it's important to start with one or two transcripts that they're coding and then uh, move on. Um, so we've been talking about this throughout the um, webinar, which is why uh, step four is perhaps misleading because we're not just starting to talk about quality control. Um, but it's very important to establish this routine. And again, as I mentioned several times, it's important to do it um, early. And um, I guess as you think about it, it's important to think about um, you know, how should the data be organized? And this relates also to the naming system, to the tracking system. Um, it's important to think about whether you'll be using a software or whether you'd, you'll be doing it manually. And um, as several of you mentioned, uh, throughout the, the webinar, it's important to think about um, being able to refer back to the original text and the original um, recording. And software can help you with that because um, I guess in the software you can bring together different types of file formats with primary and secondary data. Um, but if you're not using software, then it's even more important to have a good um, filing system. So um, using software is usually referred to as computer-assisted qualitative data analysis. But I would argue that it's actually data management and analysis because um, unlike quantitative software, qualitative data um, software doesn't actually analyze data for you, but it helps you pull it together so that you can analyze it. So it helps you basically manage it. Um, and Atlas TI and NVR the most popular. We won't be talking about them in great depth today, but um, just so you know that um, the, it, the, the, there are advantages to using these uh, software for data management. Um, it saves time, you can manage huge volume of data, um, and you can more easily do an audit trail. Um, and also there's a lot of paper involved otherwise. Um, but it can become a process where um, there is, you know, you have to invest in the new software and learning it. Um, sharing sometimes between team members can be challenging. There are particular glitches that the newer versions of the software are dealing with, but um, it's not as easy as sharing a Word document, for example. Um, but another thing that it lets you do is um, it lets you, in addition to coding the data, it lets you also code the different documents that you have. So, for example, you can code things as these are my interviews or these, is, these are my newspaper articles. And um, therefore, it makes retrieval of the data um, more, more easy. So you can essentially tag your data through this um, qualitative data software. Um, and I guess some tips for establishing your quality control routine um, is this idea that um, for transcription and coding, um, sometimes it's useful to create manuals or guides and to have those ready before the actual time of transcription or coding becomes um, necessary. Um, I've said this many times, but yes, it's important to monitor the quality, especially starting early and uh, to be able to provide feedback to the transcribers, to the coders, and especially in a larger team, and um, to really adjust um, the training, adjust the process based on the nature of the study. Um, I mean, in each study, you will have um, different dynamics and potentially a different team. So it's important to, um, to, have, to, to be able to adjust um, throughout. Um, and again, this is step five uh, about planning your time and resources. And um, it's important to um, think about this, perhaps not as the last step, but again, one of the, in the early phases, um, knowing that data management takes time, um, planning for having the um, time and the people that are needed to, um, to be able to carry out all these different tasks. Um, and I think we're almost out of time, but I'll leave you um, with just a brief summary. Um, and before I open it up for final, final questions, 
Um, and some might say that data management is boring and tedious, and some one of you actually mentioned that um, you know you need a lot of patience, um, and it's it's true. But without it, without this extra attention to detail and um, these extra efforts, it's it's very difficult to do the analysis. So it's very important to spend an adequate time uh, amount of time on this. Um, and they often say that you know you should manage your data. Don't let the data manage you. Um, and that is valid for uh, qualitative data, quantitative data, in the same way I think. Um, but basically, you know, you you already expect to have um, a lot of volume for of data, and it's important to anticipate it and to um, have a plan for it um, in the beginning. So I hope that we at least. Um, through this webinar, we're able to provide you some um, new things to think about, some new strategies and tips for managing your data. Um, as we conclude, uh, I'm going to open it up for questions one last time. Any clarification questions or anything else you wanted to bring up? Let's see, I'm going to check. I think there's a question from... Now it's a new question. Nope. So I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, in conclusion, let me just remind you, uh, well, first of all, to thank you all for coming. It's great to have such a, a, a large group um, for this, and it was great to have all your contributions. Um, it would be very helpful if you could take one or two minutes to fill out the ev evaluation at the end. Um, Please let your teammates know also that this webinar will be repeated on July 5th. So um, if your team members couldn't make it this time, or if you know somebody else who might benefit from this, please let them know. And um, we're thinking about planning the next webinar. So the next webinar will be on, uh, we're getting our um, expert librarians to come and talk to us about literature searches and also potentially bibliometric analysis. Um, and you should have received a poll for um, uh, show, sharing your availability, et cetera. So please fill that out um, as soon as possible so that we can, um, we can plan the date that works best for everybody. So um, without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining. And uh, hope to see you all at the next webinar and your teammates on um, July 5th.